What's going on guys? Today we're going to be talking about dependency injection in iOS using a pretty popular framework known as Swinject on their GitHub page here. I'm not going to read through all this example stuff since we're here to actually see an example and use it together. So let's go ahead and start by opening up Xcode and creating a new project here. And as soon as Xcode decides to cooperate, we'll go ahead and stick with a simple app under iOS. Let's call this a DI example. For those of you not familiar with DI, we'll talk through kind of what it is, what's the point. Go ahead and create the project, save it wherever you'd like. First things first, we're gonna actually want to close up Xcode here. We're gonna open up Terminal and via CocoaPods, we're gonna bring in the dependency. So let me go ahead and CD onto my desktop into the project folder, run pod in it. If you don't have Cocoa Pods installed, you can go ahead and do a pretty quick Google search how to get it installed. Go ahead and open up that pod file. I already took the liberty of copying the Cocoa Pod here. We'll go ahead and paste it on in and let's go ahead and give it an install. If you haven't done so already, make sure you also drop a like down below before we get further into the weeds of things. And let's open up this workspace and start talking about DI. So DI is a pretty agnostic concept in software development, uh, not iOS specific, and it's the idea of passing around concrete instances of objects that meet a certain signature need. Now a signature in this case can be defined or interpreted as a protocol. And the idea with larger applications or even applications that are decoupled when they're architected is we wanna make sure that we can keep objects very isolated and not tightly coupled to other objects. And when we do that, instead of passing around, uh, let's say some view controller or some type of manager, we'll pass around an instance that meets a protocol. So for example, in this case, we have this one view controller here. And what we're gonna go ahead and do, first and foremost, let's go ahead and actually import Swinject, which is what we're gonna explore today. We're gonna create another view controller, and I'll just do it at the bottom of this file for readability's sake. We'll call it second VC. I'm gonna go ahead and inherit from UI view controller. And imagine we have a view did load in here, which we in fact do. And let's say this view controller needs a dependency. It needs an object that is capable of providing a color. In this case, that color will be used as a background color. So let's go ahead and write out a protocol that would do that. So we're gonna go ahead and call it color providing. And it's going to more or less just have one property of color, and it's going to be a get only property just like that. So what we're actually going to go ahead and do here is say via the initializer, we're going to say that this uh, controller takes in a provider of type color providing. We're going to hang on to this provider in a local private property within this object, such as that. And then what we're going to actually go ahead and do after we call the uh, superclass constructor here, like that and like that. Let me go ahead and bring in the coder-based constructor so my compiler doesn't yell at me like that. What we're gonna go ahead and do is in view to load, we can go ahead and say our view's background color is going to be from our provider.color. Now this all makes sense, but how do we actually get this provider thing or something that is color providing into the second view controller. Now the first that we're gonna do is make it optional and we're gonna talk about why we're making it optional momentarily. If we're not able to get a color from this provider, we're gonna just go ahead and make it a black background. And let's actually create an object that conforms to color providing. Now I'm gonna do it up here just for uh, breaking it up visually. So let's say we have a color provider which is color providing. Hopefully that naming concept, it makes sense. And we're just gonna have basically in here, we're gonna say colors is an array of UI colors. And we're basically gonna have three random colors in here. We'll go with pink, we'll go with blue, and then we'll also go with perhaps green. And what we're gonna go ahead and do is simply return colors.randomElement. So this is an object that can go ahead and uh, of course provide colors. Now, instead of passing directly into our second view controller, the color provider instance, what we wanna do is 
we want to allow Swinject, which is the dependency management framework in today's case, to manage that dependency for us. So what that means is when we go ahead and try to instantiate the second view controller, we're going to tell Swinject, hey, go ahead and find something that's color providing, because the thing we're trying to instantiate needs a color providing thing, if that makes sense, hopefully. So what we're going to do is first and foremost, let me create a button here with a a uh, quick action that I've got, create button just like that. And we go ahead and tap on this button. What we're gonna go ahead and do is we're gonna want to go ahead and instantiate that second view controller. Now this is where things get pretty interesting. Now we don't wanna actually instantiate that second view controller directly because we'd manually be saying, okay, pass in the color provider. What we rather want to do is leverage Swinject's container and registry mechanism to get a properly configured second VC out. So let's go ahead and create something up here called a container. And it's going to be of type container, super creatively named on Swinject's part. We're going to instantiate a container in here. And this is where the magic more or less happens. The concept of a container and service registry based dependency injection is we tell a container here is a concrete class, in this case color provider, which suffices the need of the protocol color providing. And the way we do that is as follows. We're going to say go ahead and register for color providing and we can get rid of name here. Go ahead and register and this factory is more or less a block, a closure, where we can instantiate and return the concrete object, a struct or class that meets the need of that interface, just like that. Now you might be wondering, what is this thing, this resolver in? Let's ignore this momentarily. We'll just use underscores as we don't actually use it. Now, more specifically, when we come down here, we want to actually ask this container thing up there that we declared, hey, give me a second view controller that meets the need um, of color providing to be instantiated. So in essence, what we actually want to do here is we also want to register for second VC dot self, once again, getting random name here, a factory block, which will create and return it. So I'm going to use resolver here momentarily. But what you'll notice is when we try to actually instantiate second VC, we need to actually pass in color providing. So what gives? How do we actually get color providing in here? Because we just registered it up above. So we can't just say color provider because that's kind of cheating. That defeats the purpose. That's where this resolver thing comes into play. What we're going to do is we're going to say resolver, go ahead and resolve something that is color providing uh, dot self. And let me go ahead and collapse this left panel a little bit so it doesn't line wrap. All right, just like that. And the idea is the resolver will go ahead and try to find something within its containers within the Swinject framework that we have registered to meet the need of color providing. Now, this also goes back to why I went ahead and made this provider optional, because if the resolver is not able to resolve something that meets the needs of that protocol, it's going to return nil, other words, optional. Now, other dependency injection frameworks will go ahead and force unwrap things. And of course, in that case, your app will crash. So that's a pretty debatable topic of the best way to gracefully fall back. But I digress. That's why we need optionality in the case of Swinject. So now that we've got these two things registered here, how do we actually use it? So when the user clicks on this button here, we're going to go ahead and say, give me a view controller back for second VC. Now, once again, our resolution functions return optional. So from the container, we're going to go ahead and say, go ahead and resolve second VC dot self. And we want to go ahead and unwrap it because otherwise this VC will be optional. We can't actually present it. And here we're going to go ahead and say present vc animated true now this basically circumvents the need of instantiation of this controller at this point in time more specifically what we're doing is we're instantiating it with a proper resolver here at the time of registering this controller itself so let me go ahead and give us a run in our simulator and let's actually see what we end up getting so we should go ahead and see our button here momentarily as soon as our uh, app loads. There we are. I think the color is a little screwed up, which is why we didn't see it in light mode. If I go ahead and tap it, we see that we get a black background. So that's not good. Something's going uh, wrong here. So let's figure out what it is so we can fix it together. So we're definitely instantiating uh, this view controller here. 
Uh, in this case, what we're doing is we're saying for color providing, it goes ahead and it registers, we register a color provider. And in this case, we are actually returning a proper color. Now in the case of the controller, we're saying register second VC dot self. We take the resolver, we instantiate the second VC with resolver dot uh, resolve a color providing. This should be providing, not provider. Once again, we want to actually provide, we want to resolve an object that meets the needs of a protocol. We don't want to tightly couple the object itself. So if we go ahead and give this a run once more, now you'll see we'll actually get a color back. And once again, to uh, just to remind you folks, it'll be black if we're not able to resolve a color. Otherwise, from our injected color providing object, whatever it may be, what we're doing in here in this concrete implementation is we create an array of pink, blue, and green, and we randomly return it each time. So every single time we actually go ahead and click this button, it actually resolves it. So one thing that's really important here that I'll close with is some, some folks watching might say, well, this is really inefficient. You have to actually instantiate this controller ahead of time and you're kind of hanging on to it until you resolve it. And that's actually not the case of what's going on. The way that Swinject and a lot of DI frameworks work is they only execute this block when a resolver is trying to resolve the thing here, which is second VC. So the way you can actually visualize this is notice the color actually changes when I open present and dismiss this. Now, sometimes the color is just the same because in our random element selection up here just happens to resolve to the same color. But the point is that every single time this resolve is called for the second VC, we actually reach into the container, we execute this block, effectively creating a new instance, resolving a color providing up object, an element, and then we return it. Now, it's a little debatable for your use case if you want to actually persist prior instances, but I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole since it's a very, very complex and very broad topic. So that is dependency injection in a nutshell with Swinject. Swinject is pretty popular. It's open source, and albeit this is a fairly straightforward example, but this is heavily used when you are working with your application split across a variety of modules, different frameworks, different static libraries with varying degrees of dependency management in your dependency hierarchy. So with that, if you haven't dropped a like down below, make sure to do so for the YouTube algorithm. Let me know in the comments if you use DI in your iOS apps, what you think of it, if you have any questions. And as always, subscribe for more content. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.